Hi, I'm Mike Morrissey. Every year, a group of 30-plus medical professionals travel to San Lucas Taliman in Guatemala to perform orthopedic surgery on local children. In March of 2019, I joined the team to document their work. The following is an interview with one of the team members. Hi, I'm Libby Weber, and I'm from Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare in St. Paul, Minnesota. How is it you came to work there? A little bit of a circuitous route, but I'm in pediatric orthopedics. I treat children with um, congenital diseases of bones and muscles, and I uh, had previously been working on the East Coast. My group decided to start incorporating level one trauma into their practice, and they asked me to come out and start that program. What is level one trauma? Some adult hospitals and some children's hospitals have emergency rooms, and you can go there for emergency care. They are rated in terms of the types of trauma they can see, and level one is the highest level where the helicopters come in. And in general, there's only one or two of those places in each state. Um, so there's only one level one trauma center for children, freestanding hospital in the state of Minnesota. And they get a very big grant to put a helicopter pad on top of their hospital and develop a program. And for that, they need 24 seven orthopedic coverage. So they just needed more people. They need to start the program in orthopedics and they need more people to come out. What motivated you to go into this line of work? I um, went into medicine pretty late in life, and I realized very early on that I liked procedures, I liked surgery, and so I decided to uh, do orthopedic surgery. And um, immediately when I did my rotation as a resident on pediatrics, I realized that the pathology is very divergent. There, it's a, it's a very um, diverse set of surgeries that you do, unlike other uh, adult orthopedists do total knees only or total hips only, or they do sports medicine things. But with children, you do all of that, everything, plus the fact that they have growth plates and they have unique fracture patterns. So uh, I just found it really fascinating and never dull. And, and, the, ki and the kids are great. <laughs> so the kids are great. You know, it's fantastic working with the children. Did you have another career before you decided to go into the medical profession? Yeah, I spent, uh, I spent a bunch of time in the military. I was in the Air Force. What did you do in the military? I flew planes. Wow, what kind of planes did you fly? Uh, for the, my first assignment was C-21s, which are Lear jets, and I was dragging generals around and um, senators and congressmen. But part of that job, I was doing um, time critical transportation of organs and uh, critically ill patients. So uh, that got me interested in medicine. I, was, I have nothing to do with medicine before that. I have a political science degree. I mean, there's nothing, no one in my family's in medicine. There's not a medical school in Maine where I'm from. So it wasn't on the radar, but, um, but just that exposure and experience. Um, my second plane was a KC-135, which is a very big plane. It carries fuel, and we offload fuel to planes in the air. So I spent almost that entire tour, though, in Saudi Arabia uh, during Desert Storm, which I'm proud to have done. I'm glad I did it. Um, and uh, it was sort of after that tour that I decided I was going to try something else. So when you went into medical school, did you start out wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon? No. I uh, kind of thought the thing to do, the thing, the best thing for my community was to go into family medicine and help the people around me and deliver babies. And I, I like it. I like to have lots of different things to do. And again, in the field of orthopedics, pediatrics is the most diverse. Um, but in medicine, before I had decided what to do, I thought family medicine kind of soup to nuts, deliver the babies and get their immunizations up to speed and see their um, well child checks and but their illnesses and then up through adulthood and into their senior care. That was my expectation. But again, I became very passionate about procedures. I had no idea I'd walk into an operating room and decide I couldn't leave. So <laughs> that's sort of... Happen. Do you specialize in a specific disease? Our hospital has the largest um, patient population of cerebral palsy in the world, I think. I might, I might be misspeaking, but certainly in the United States. So cerebral palsy is a very big focus for our hospital. Um, and then I um, am also a traumatologist, so I do the trauma for the children. And I think that within our group, each of us have little tiny niches that we like to try to um, we're the, I'm the go-to person for amputation and, and for quite a few foot deformities as well. Libby, could you explain to us what cerebral palsy is? Cerebral palsy is a disease that encompasses um, a wide variety of um, effects on the body. And it results when a, a developing brain is subjected to an anoxic insult. That means lacking oxygen. So the baby can have a stroke 
in utero. The baby can have a very difficult delivery with prolonged time that they're not receiving oxygen. They can have a bleed in their head as a result of trauma as a small baby where the oxygen isn't getting to the right places in the developing brain. And really up to two years of age, any anoxic injury and near drowning or an suffocation of some sort can cause these problems. The developing brain and nerves um, subsequently be there are different types of cerebral palsy, but the most prevalent by far is spastic, and it causes the signaling to the muscles and back from the muscles to cause spasticity. So those children are developing. They have a very hard time walking. Their motor milestones are commonly delayed, and their developing bones rely on normal muscle tone around um, the developing bone to develop correctly. And so they, unfortunately, in addition to having a hard time walking, walking late, consuming a lot of oxygen to walk, their bones are developing with internal twists and sometimes with uh, contractures. So it's a very challenging disease to treat. We have an amazing um, protocol at our hospital in which we get these babies in very, very early and we start them on physical therapy and we get them into braces and we get them into um, special programs that help them. And then they get orthopedic surgery at the appropriate time and they get neurosurgery at the appropriate time. And they have doctors called PM&R doctors, physical medicine and rehabilitation who are following them for their bracing and physical therapy needs. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a complex disease, but we think we put together a pretty good program for those kids. I videoed you yesterday performing a surgery on a young girl. Can you tell us about that surgery and what you've done to improve her condition? Yes, so her condition is cerebral palsy. It's a diplegia, and that description means it affects her lower, her, both of her lower extremities. She's ambulatory diplegic, means she walks. She's, she's got enough control of her muscles and enough strength that she can walk, but she's a challenging time. Her bones have developed where her femur bones are very internal, so she trips over her feet. And her adductor muscles, the muscles that bring her knees together at the hips, those muscles are too tight all the time and too spastic for her. So the procedure we did was loosening those muscles in her groin to make those uh, legs spread out a little bit better for her. And then we turned her femurs from internal to neutral. Um, that's gonna take about six weeks for her to heal. And then she's gonna be able to walk a lot better. The unfortunate thing about cerebral palsy is we cannot do anything about the spasticity. We can't cure the cerebral palsy. Um, there's very limited spasticity control here in Guatemala. So um, depending on how young a child is when they get the procedure, they commonly recur their deformity and have to have surgery again. So that's quite common. Do you see more cerebral palsy cases in Guatemala than you do in the United States? No. We see quite a bit of it here, but there's quite a bit in the United States as well. Yeah. I think they come from different reasons. I think that there's a lot of home birth here, and I think that there are a lot of you know, unfortunate things that happen during home births. And, you know, and so these children, if they're 40 weeks gestation and have a little problem with delivery, they're, they're typically quite mildly affected. I think the reason that we see cerebral palsy with such prevalence in the United States is we're saving babies at 21, 22 weeks. And those babies are too frail. They, they have bleeds in their heads. And so, they, so their cerebral palsy can be a lot more devastating. Is there a particular patient from these missions that stands out in your mind? They all stand out. They all, they just live in my heart, all of these patients, because I remember every single one of them and I review the cases when I get home and I'm constantly talking to Will about their follow-up and we're exchanging emails and uh, x-rays so that I can see how they're doing. Um, but it, since you asked, at the dinner that we had last night, I was speaking with one of the nurses through an interpreter and she said that uh, Francisco, my friend Francisco, um, was living in town and doing well and really wanted to see me. And I, sometimes the patients come, even if they're feeling well, to the to the screening day just to come and see us and thank mm -hmm. us. Um, so anyway, he popped in today and it was nice to see him. He's a 40-year-old manual laborer. He's at, probably at this point, he's almost 50, but um, he was a 40-year-old manual laborer. He, he was in Guatemala City with his daughter and got carjacked at gunpoint and they wanted to take his car, which he had a problem with, but they wanted to also take his daughter and he had a huge problem with that. So he got in a fight with a gunman and got shot. He um, had shattered his femur. He had a surgery in Guatemala City. Um, it didn't work. And so then they did another surgery with a plate and screws and um, it got infected. And I'm not exactly clear how it is that he didn't go back to that hospital, but he showed up to our screening very sick. We spent a couple of years fixing him. We got the infection cleared the first year and then we had to span him with an external fixation device the next year and then we fixed him the year after that. And he's walking around doing his job, 
daughter has a baby. <laughs> so yeah, it's just a great story, but there are so, so many stories. How does it compare to work here in this hospital compared to your very well-equipped hospital in St. Paul? Um, it's challenging and it's, and, it, and it's nerve wracking, but I think that it, it really ups your game. First of all, it makes you go home and appreciate how great everyone has, it, how great your life is, how great your patients' lives are. Um, but it also makes you more of an innovator. You can't get stuck in a rut and, and, you know, have to have the exact same suture anchor every time. It's not, you know, we're cutting screws because we don't have the right lengths and we're doing ridiculous things down here. But it works and it's healing these kids. So yeah. it's fine. Well, thank you very much, Libby.